So today I'm going to talk about vocabulary, which at any time is key. But when our students have been off the page and haven't been attending to text, it can be something that really needs to come center in our thinking about instruction, in our delivery of instruction. So I, want to, I always start by bringing in the people for whom I work. And um, I just also want to make two prefatory comments. If you look at the young woman on the left side of your screen, I'm really hoping that you don't look like this at the end of the presentation. So that's one of my goals, as well as communicating some information. And I also hope that something I say to you today validates something you've done, have thought about doing, or would like to do. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a chance to send me a small change and be part of um, a drawing for my latest book on vocabulary. So keep that in mind. I think both in our personal and professional lives that small steps are the ways in which we lay the foundation for substantive change. Now, I can be somewhat like those chickens that are free ranging. Sometimes I um, can get what I think is a brilliant idea and start going in that direction. And in the event that I do that, I always have a GPS. And the first, there are gonna be four points on the GPS. And the first point on the GPS is that our knowledge of humankind is in text. We read, not just because reading's a good thing. Reading is where humankind has stored what they've learned. So if you think of this as starting out when the defense contractors, academics started using the internet in the 1980s to 2007, I'm suggesting these are the amounts of information <clears throat> that from my very um, clumsy attempt here to present information, what I'm suggesting is that undoubtedly how I'm representing 2020 is um, much um, too minimal, that there's actually a lot more information, some of it useful, some of it not so much, in our 24-7 library. The point here is we live in an age of information. And fundamental to information is text. Now, to a certain point in your life, when you're a preschooler, up through some point in the primary grades, you're getting a lot of your information through speech. But at some point, there's information that you only get from text. Yes, there are videos, there's streaming, but keep remember, except for the weird cat videos, the streaming and the videos all started out as scripts which were written. Now this past fall, I visited some of the greatest libraries in Western Europe. And here's one in Vienna, it's the National Library of um, Austria. And one of the reasons I show this picture is because I think it's just so amazing. If you see the little pieces of paper, those are where books, it's, it's a working library, so those are where books have been taken out and somebody's using them somewhere. Now, I went to all these libraries that had been um, instituted, some of them in the Middle Ages, and I kept asking the question, is this information available in a digital form? And what I learned is, in most cases, it was. And what you're going to see here is that this little phone has all of the information in this library, and I'm only showing you a tiny part of it and then every other library we've ever had. So whether we started out with stone tablets, or we started out with books, or now things are in bytes, what we know is stored in text. We read 
to learn. And I, when I talk about learning, I'm also referring to the learning that we get as individuals from narrative text. In narrative text, we understand how people in other periods of time dealt with challenges, such as the challenges we're um, undergoing right now. Nobody had this particular challenge, but humankind has dealt with challenge, and narratives are where we get that information. Now, I want to point out that if you rely on all of your information from oral language, there are going to be big gaps in what you find out. It's going to be very idiosyncratic what you learn. A study by Hayes and his colleagues looked at the number of rare words in conversations in television programs and so on. What they found is that a conversation between two college educated adults has fewer rare words than the typical books that we read to young children. Think about that. Now I've spent a lot of time in coffee shops in the past and I can verify that there can be some very, very um, um, inarticulate speech when I listen to people's conversations. In fact, I live in a town where there's a lot of surfing and you can get a long way in my town if you know a single word. And that word is dude. Okay, so and I listen to these conversations and they're kind of like, um, okay, that, you know what happened and then what happened and so on. What I'm saying is that in text, we use more words than we typically do in conversations. Now, not in a conversation such as I'm having with you today and the other speakers are having, but in our day-to-day -day lives, the number of things you're gonna learn and rare words are one of the ways in which we learn things. So we know that what I know influences how well I comprehend. In fact, this is one of the most solid findings we have in research. The relationship between my knowledge of a topic and what I comprehend on that topic is almost perfect. But at the same time, we know that what you expand in your thinking comes from text. Texts are critical, not just because it's a nice goal that we have for kids to read, but it's because it's where we as human beings have recorded the things that are important to us, both personally and also our observations about the world. So it's a two-way interaction. To know more and be able to comprehend more, I actually depend on text. And what's at the basis of text are words. So my second point here is that words are the labels for the concepts that underlie knowledge. And while I was talking about rare words, and they're essential, we also have to recognize that a very small group of fairly common words, I'm going to describe them as word families, and I'm going to describe, define that in just a little bit, but they account for the majority of the words in text. These families represent some really important knowledge about both the world and also about how English works. For a lot of our kids, a lot of them, they simply haven't read enough to get good at these 2,500 word families. We changed our model of text in the United States about 25 years ago to authentic only texts. Now, I'm a strong advocate of great texts, but we also need some texts that have some understanding of how you progress in reading. Not all the time, but some of the time. So let me describe what I mean by this. So English has a great many words. Here's the Oxford English Dictionary. And in that dictionary, there are almost 300,000 root words. And if we actually began looking at the different meanings in those root words, there are many more words. Together with derivatives, 
and some of the obsolete words that sometimes we see in the text that appear on um, assessments that we do. We often use texts that are in the public domain and sometimes they can have some pretty obsolete words. So what I'm saying is we have an incredible number of words in English. And that's a conundrum for us as teachers. What words do you teach? So let's take a look at these words. These are words that have been pulled out for instruction for a particular story. What do you think this text is about? Now, I really uh, am grateful that I can give this presentation today without getting on a plane. At the same time, I have to tell you that I really miss you. I miss the opportunity to look in your eyes, to see you nodding, to hear your questions on the spot, and um, to get the energy in a room. So I can't find out what you're thinking about what the story is about, but let me tell you what it's about. It's the book, Me and Uncle Romy. And it's a story both of a boy's coming of age and also the story of him learning about his uncle who's a famous collage artist. Now, when I look at these words, excuse me, like yanked and streaked, the only word that actually gets close to the idea of art is studio, well, maybe smeared. But the point here is that in this book, there are a lot of words, about 1,700 total words. And the size of the word shows you how many times it's repeated. So Romy happens a lot in the text. Now, when I pull out all of the words, I've got 600 and, uh, and one unique words is what I had on that last slide. And 11% of them are rare in written English. Now, if you look at some of these rare words like footsteps and sister, schedule, you know, just because it's rare doesn't mean I don't know what it means. It just means it doesn't appear a lot in text. But the question is, did those words that were chosen for instruction, and it happened that two core reading programs use the same text? And as you see, two words were shared. One of the questions is, do you really need to understand the word picture? And right now we're not sure how they use that word picture. A word like cardboard, is actually a word that most kids know and we can figure out pretty quickly. Why these words? And that's the question that underlay the research that I've done for the last 15 years. Which words could give students the most bang for the buck? I call it a parsimonious and economical vocabulary. So how did I go about doing it? Well, I had about 10,000 texts scanned. By this point, we've got about 12,000. But my initial analysis was based on 10,000 student texts. And I have to admit, it was a sample of text that I was interested in at a particular point of time. Perhaps it was a, a set of texts that had been used in an intervention. Or perhaps it was a set of texts that the Common Core State Standards people said were exemplary, but altogether 10,000 texts on this little computer that I'm looking at right now. Then what I did is I got a word analyzer, and the word analyzer actually gives right now about 15 characteristics of words, but let me show you what the characteristics of these two words are, ruined and feast, the two words that were shared across all these programs. One thing, we know that makes a difference in, in kids' word recognition is the length of the word. Okay, so these words are about the same length. The number of times the kids are going to experience words in text, we call that a U function. Okay, and it turns out these two words have the same function. Another thing that makes a difference is whether the word is in students or a language. And it turns out now in the digital world, not only can we scan 10,000 texts, we can get an analytical tool like this, but there are researchers around the world who have come up with some incredibly great databases. So there's a fabulous database on age of acquisition and also on concreteness. And then we're also, so these are all variables that researchers told us can influence 
the speed and the memory of words of, in word recognition for students. Okay, in lots of ways, these words are fairly common, I have a lot of similarities, but what we see here is that ruined is likely a little bit less concrete. And it also has a larger morphological family, which would lead me to think that that might be a better word to teach. So what was the next step in our research? What I did is I took the 10,000 texts and I asked the question, if in fact about 90% of the words you read need to be recognized fairly automatically, well, not fairly, but automatically, how many words account for 90% of typical texts? And what I've established is that there are these 2,500 word families. Now, what's a word family? A word family is a root word and the inflected and derived words around it. Okay, so help is a root word. Helping, helped, helps are inflected endings. Uh, unhelpful has both a prefix and a suffix. That's an example of a word family. In the next line of our research, we looked at words in what I call zones six to seven. So in zones one to five, you know, we've got what? A um, hundred words that account for about 48% of the text. Those are words that are often very, very abstract and often also have variant vowel patterns, right? Like the and of. The words above this 90%, the words in purple, um, the light purple, those words occur nine to one time per million words of text. The best research that we have, and this is an area where if you are a researcher, we could really use your help, because a lot of features of words obviously influence the memory of a word, but we know that you need to have a number of repetitions of, of a word, likely about 10. And again, that's a general rule and um, you know we used to have texts where they algorithmically ensured that you had 10 repetitions of every word or 20 or 30 whatever no we need more research on that but what i'm saying is i've parsed the words by the number of times they're predicted to appear in text okay so we've got a group of another 2500 word families here in zone six and seven and then we've got an enormous number of additional words that appear less than once per million. 20% of those words, by the way, are proper names. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about proper names today. That might be something if you wanna check out my website and I'm gonna give you the URL for that. I've done a lot of thinking about that because proper names, it turns out, don't really have the same kind of meaning as other words. You know, like Alfreda, does mean something in German, but when it's extended far beyond that culture, it's the name of somebody. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the distribution of words in English. So here's what I, I'm arguing, and we've been demonstrating, that um, if you aren't highly fluent with these 2,500 word families that account for the majority of the words in text, it's gonna be really hard for you to handle the rare words. It doesn't mean all the rare words are automatic for you, but without automaticity, with these 2,500 words, word families, it's gonna be hard sledding. Now, I did a proof of concept. So what I did is part of my database are the exemplars that the Common Core folks said to them, were, were outstanding texts that should be read or read, uh, kids should be able to read them at different grade levels. And what I established is, you can see here the percentages. In grade one, the percentage of the words, and they're not all the families by any stretch of the imagination, but it's about 97% of the words are accounted for by this group of word families. And even in college and career ready, we're at about 89%. So we have evidence that these are really important words. Now, 
Here are some examples of these words. They're not just Dolch words by any stretch of the imagination. And I want to remind you when you see a word like discovery, this represents an entire family. No, discovery isn't the root word, but we use the first word that appears in the database um, as the representative of the family. Okay, so this is giving you an idea of the breadth of these words. Now, when we've done additional analysis of the words, we start out with them as word families, but what I've discovered, because part of my analysis tool, I'm able to look at the semantic families that Bob Marzano and Jana Marzano identified about 35 years ago. And what I've discovered is within these 25 families, the big ideas of our social and physical worlds are present. So we've got big ideas related to health and the human body. We've got big ideas related to places and dwellings and things like market and muscles. These words appear not just in informational text, but they also appear in stories. I mean, a fundamental part of a story is the setting. Okay, so there are about, this gives you some idea. At Text Project, we have pictures for the concrete words in each of these groups, and there are about 15, 16 of them. There are different ways you can parse this. I'm not saying there's a right answer, but these are important ideas. These aren't lists to be memorized. The second part of, the, of these families is that they're families, and that's an important thing to, to, to remember. So it's not just saying, oh, I'm going to learn these lead words. It's remembering that you have to have a sense of how English works. There's a phonological system and there's a morphological system that connects with the phonological system. And in English, we have a very unusual language in that it has two fairly distinctive language sources. A language like Spanish doesn't have two distinctive ones. In English, we start out as an Anglo-Saxon language. Okay, initially there were people who spoke the languages that are now um, in Wales and Scotland and Ireland. But when the Anglo-Saxons who spoke a form of German came, they pushed those people out. And the part of Great Britain was Anglo-Saxon. And I'm gonna tell you a little story of English with food. Okay, the first part of this is that English as a Germanic base has an incredible number of compound words, which is why I use bratwurst as the base. Okay, so we start out with a language that has lots of little words like bat, cat, mat, sat, and we put those little words together to form a lot of compound words. Now at a particular point in time, it was actually 1066, the Normans who spoke a form of French invade Great Britain. So we got the baguettes, you know, we put the base, the bratwurst into the baguette. And French was a language that functions differently than Anglo-Saxon. We don't see the compounding here. We say a lot of phrases and we see a lot of derivations. So it actually turns out in the German level of English, there are very few prefixes and suffixes. And most of them started out as compound words like asleep, awake, helpful. Those are examples of words with um, the Anglo Saxon suffixes and prefixes. Now, what happened during a period of time in Great Britain for about 300 years while the Normans were in charge is that the aristocrats spoke French and the working people spoke Anglo-Saxon. So what you have is a system where for almost every word you can think of, you have two different words or three or four or five or six, but there are a lot of words that cluster around topics. Okay, so you'll have a word like easy, and you'll have a word like facile. 
And facile functions quite differently in terms of its construction, facilitate, facilitator, and so on. Now, English also has another layer, and that's the Greek layer. And most languages bring in these words. So once we have the Reformation, excuse me, the Renaissance, we add words. And, and, and Greek functions has a different morphological system than either the French or the Germanic ones. I think I'm probably taking a little too long on some of this because I want to get into the actions we need to be taking part in. But um, this is going to be available for you at Text Project. I think that Mike and his people are putting it on too. But a really great way for kids to understand this. And yes, I please don't think that kids are memorizing where these words fit. But to understand that the base of English are these little words, down to earth words, as Bob Kelphy called them, that um, function often in compounding, which is different, as you see, than the way we're making words and derivations in the Romance level. And in the Greek level, we're actually again compounding, but the compounds have very different characteristics than the compounds in the Anglo-Saxon level. The third point that I want to make about the core vocabulary is that there are just a multiple number of meanings of common words. So if you think of a word like set or even a word like shape, there are lots of different meanings for words. And sometimes those words can actually be contradictory. Okay, so to be good with the core vocabulary is not about memorizing a group of words. It's about doing enough reading so that you get facile with topics, you get facile with the morphological system, and you also have the expectation. A group of researchers like Laura Stacy and Rob Savage are talking about a set for variability. They're talking about that in relation to um, the graphene phoneme system, but I think you also have to set for variability in terms of word meanings. Okay, so let's breathe here for a minute. And now we're on to our third idea. So we've got this base set of words, but now you also have to remember that we have three or four rare words in every text. And what I'm suggesting to kids is this is information you need to know starting toward the end of second grade. Lots of kids don't know what makes text hard for them. They need to know that it's a text will have three to four rare words and there are some connections across those words. They're not just random words. And a lot of them you're already going to know. And not knowing them doesn't mean you're not a good reader. These rare words are your source of learning new things. So let me share with you what we've done in our database of our 10,000 texts is we've looked at, these are percentages here on the left-hand side of total words and texts. And what you're seeing here is that, I'm sorry, I changed the colors at the end. So it's actually quite the opposite. Um, the, um, <laughs> I'm really sorry, the blue is information and, and the green is narrative. What you're seeing is that yes, early on, we always think that um, informational texts have more rare words, but as we get into the higher levels, it's actually the narrative text. So keep remembering the green is narrative. Okay, so you're always gonna have rare words. Now, one of the things about the rare words, and they often occur, they're not equally distributed across the text, but they often occur in the beginnings of text. So here you see in a text, um, this is from um, The Wizard of Oz, a writer of a narrative text doesn't keep using the word dazzled and brilliant and sparkling and glittering, okay? They use a lot of synonyms. You, some of you maybe learned to read with Dick and Jane like I did, and Dick and Jane had um, obsessive compulsive disorder, and they kept using the same words over and over again, like hop, 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 or uh, jump, 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 or stop, stop, stop. Um, that's not how a good narrative writer writes. Good narrative writers use a thesaurus, whether it's a real one or in their heads. And it turns out that the words, you know, we could pick out, and that's often what happens in our reading instruction, we pick out a single word, and do all kinds of song and dances around it. 
but don't help kids see that it's part of a family of words. Now, one of the things I just realized I didn't include here is the slide that shows the main groups of synonyms in information, in, excuse me, in narrative text, and I'll show you where you can find that at Text Project later. I'm trying to share everything I know with you in an hour, so uh, I apologize that I, I made some choices um, and didn't include that. Now, an informational text, an informational text writer doesn't go looking for a synonym for solvent. The narrative writer is capturing a mood, and to capture that mood, they're using a lot of rich words. In an informational text, it actually turns out that you use the same word and the derivatives because you're communicating a particular idea. So yes, it turns out that, well, early on, some informational texts can have more rare words, but not to the level that we often think. Actually, it turns out that in, in informational text for fluency instruction, I always use informational text because in informational text, it makes sense to repeat words. And I'm gonna show you some of those in, in just a minute. Okay, now the thing about the words in informational text, they occur in networks as well. So we got synonym networks in narrative text, informational text through topical networks. And in these topical networks, these aren't synonyms. And it actually turns out that in these clusters of ideas, you need the words, the keywords from one cluster to define, define the words in the others. So the words are all interrelated. It can really help for kids to actually see how some of this is built, to know that they're gonna get into these topical clusters and to start developing some background on these clusters. Okay, now to the stuff that you've been waiting for. So what does this mean? What have I said before? We read to learn things, personally, socially, and about our physical worlds. Words are the means for communicating that knowledge. And there's a very small group of words that makes a really big difference in text. And then there are rare words that really give the flavor to narratives and communicate some really important points about informational text. And we need to be attending to those as well. How do we do that? I describe the kids that I work for um, as kids who depend on public schools to become highly literate and never more so than now. I'm gonna give you three actions. I might not get to the third one <clears throat> and I've actually provided that as a handout. So while you look at this slide, I'm actually gonna take a little drink of water. Okay, the first action, <clears throat> and I think more now than ever, we've got an opportunity. You know, it's not about covering every single strategy that you can think of related to comprehension. In fact, the work of people like Willingham shows that, you know, getting kids to think about text is what's important, getting them to monitor text, and getting them to recognize that texts are about learning things, whether it's narrative or informational text. What I'm gonna suggest is the more we can do at the present time for building knowledge networks through text, the more we're gonna serve our kids. So let me show you a typical text, a program of level text, where every text, whether it's informational or narrative, jumps to a different topic. What happens when you do this is you're actually getting really great or ready for playing things like Trivial Pursuit, but you're not building anchored bodies of knowledge. So instead, what you want to look at is, can we connect text, including narrative and informational text, in ways that emphasize the shared knowledge? So let me show you. I took those two texts, 11,400 words. That's actually quite a few words for second graders. Um, likely take them through about um, a, a trimester of, of school. 
And what you're seeing here is that when I cluster the books around knowledge, around shared themes, around topics, we have a lot more word families. Okay, and we also keep remembering that any text you use, you're going to have a lot of the 2,500 words, but you actually condense the number of different rare words you have. So you're actually having some experience with rare words. So here's some examples of some really critical semantic clusters. You know, those knowledge bases that I was talking about? So as I said, in a program that hasn't been clustered or intentionally around content, you're going to see some of these words. But what you see in a knowledge-based text is greater repetition of particular words, and you enrich the concept. In some cases, you enrich the concept immeasurably. Okay, so some, some um, domains, like the jobs of people, are really critical things to understand when you're reading narrative, and it also extends into social studies and even into science. And so what I'm showing here is when we start clustering text by topics, we, we focus our vocabulary. Now, we also, and I think now in this <clears throat> unusual time that we're in, I think focusing on what kids are learning with the text and ensuring that they have some way of storing, sharing, and remembering what, what they've learned. I'm hoping when people uh, come back to school communities, and some of this is virtual, that we have the journals, the notebooks that kids are willing to share. Okay, so. What I'm saying is, when I'm learning something, it's really critical that I have some way of documenting it. I think word maps are just about the best thing you can be doing. And at Text Project, I've provided you with, um, I don't know, I think there are about 70 or 80 of them around common words. Uh, and by the way, there are also forms for kids to fill out. I'm not saying you teach all this at once. This is from the teacher's guide. I think books and essays. I would love for libraries. Uh, first of all, I'm hoping libraries will be emptied out as we get packets ready for the kids if um, they're going to be doing some distance learning. And eventually, I hope that we fill our libraries with books our students have written as well. And of course, they're going to return those books. But um, we want to emphasize knowledge, and we want to emphasize what it is that you've been learning. OK, the second action is that we want to ensure facility with the core vocabulary. And as I said early on, this doesn't necessarily happen with just any text. Now, I'm going to show you some text that I've been working on. And I don't want you to think that I'm saying we don't read um, other texts, the ones that fall into the trade book category. Please don't think that. But I'm saying for kids who need experience with the core vocabulary, it doesn't just happen when you've got a number of rare words. As we saw in these texts, you're seeing about what? six rare words for every hundred. That's a lot. So what I've worked on over, the t over a period of time is to generate a set of texts for you. These are all open access. Remember, everything at Text Project is open access, which means you can use it. You just can't use it to make money. But all of these texts are built around the core vocabulary at different stages. No, they don't follow the guided reading levels which in fact, I don't understand quite what the basis for some of those are in relation to the words kids need to read. What they do is they follow a progression of words within the core vocabulary. So we've got a great set of text. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about the FYIs. So these are one pagers, okay, that have to do with critical background topics. We've got, oops, we've got, summer reads, which I think don't just need to be used in the summer, but we've got 21 texts with about seven different um, 
separate sections. We've got my personal favorite are these stories of words. Um, this has been a project of passion and interest for me. And we've got 16 books that look at how words are made. Where do, where do new words come from? We talked about the Anglo-Saxon words, we talked about the French and Greek words. But when we um, invent something new like movies, or when we come into contact with a new culture, or when we name places, where do words come from? Okay, then we also have talking points for kids, which um, are a set of texts on a topic like living in zoos or plastic bags. And they give different points of view, but all of these are written to emphasize the core vocabulary. And finally, we've got a set of beginning reads that um, are intended for kids to develop, to have a modicum of repetition with the words that matter most that are phonetically regular and are um, highly prolific. So let me show you how one of these texts looks. So this is one of the FYIs. And in an FYI, these texts have been written. I also have a product that um, was used uh, about a decade ago, it's still around, but called Quick Reads, and it's the same model here. So when you have a rare word, we try and repeat it, but there aren't more than about two or three rare words for every hundred, okay? So this gives you uh, the words in yellow or the words in the core vocabulary, the purple words are the rare words, okay? And, and we cover topics that appear in stories, that appear in metaphors and so on, and we also do a lot with um, the stories of children who have done brave and courageous things. I think that's a really important thing to be telling our students about. Now, for some kids, especially ones that have not been attending to text over the last while, I'm going to suggest that a part of a school day spent on a digital resource can be helpful. This is the first time in a 45 year career, I think I was introduced as having, I think it actually might be a little longer now, but this is the first time in 40 years of giving presentations to teachers that I'm actually gonna talk about a product that I've been involved in. And I wanna point out that if anybody has an interest in it, if anybody purchases anything, all of the royalties are gonna go back into a fund for teachers. Maybe that's gonna be the teacher party. We're still working with our attorney on that, but I wanna reassure you that this isn't about me using this um, context um, to, for financial gain. I think that this resource is just an incredible um, opportunity to get kids back on the page and keep them there. For us as teachers, especially in distance contexts, even in a whole class context when we have even 20 kids in one place, it's really hard to tell whether kids are monitoring and attending to the text. As a result of that, we've done an awful lot of oral reading, and I'm gonna actually suggest that it's silent reading once you're in grade three that really starts to matter. But this program, and it is my imprint, in other words, what you see in there reflects my choices. Um, it's built around themes over six grades. Kids are learning some things about jobs, about the arts. I'm a really strong proponent of, of books around art, music, sculpture, and so on. About heroes, um, oops, I seem to, this seems to have a life of its own. But what I want to point out here is that these topics and the vocabulary in them, so the 2,500 word families progress across these topics and the level of the vocabulary gets richer as kids move through this. Yes, there are rare words, but we've maintained that same model of three at maximum four words per hundred. And when there are rare words, those words are repeated. That's the only way we're gonna get kids to have any kind of automaticity. 
and the models of um, graphene phoneme correspondences like linea aries, repetition is a mechanism for kids to learn. And that's something we often haven't been talking about as we talk about the science of reading, that our text changed immensely in the early 1990s. And the lack of repetition of words is something that people like Barbara Foreman, Jill Fitzgerald have underscored. Yes, words in the top 100 obviously are gonna be repeated, but Foreman in an analysis of text adopted in Texas showed that at least 40% of the words in grade one appeared a single time and sometimes even more depending on how you're going about counting it. Also want to point out <clears throat> that there's some really great games in this program. And I was adamant that a word never appear without there being a sentence that, it's, that um, the word is related to. So students are doing more reading when they're doing games and they're reading in the context of meaningful um, sentences, meaningful paragraphs and so on. Okay, <clears throat> I do have time for the third point. I provided this to you as um, a handout, but let me talk with you about lessons. So what have I said so far? I've said that we need to think about clustering texts. We need to think about curating texts so that they're around topics. Just a second. And we need to also ensure that the kids, um, you know, Mike's team was showing you the assessments that you can use. The lack of fluency often reflects not having had a lot of experience with the 2,500 morphological word families. But we also want to provide lessons on how words work. We don't want to keep these things a secret. For example, the aspects of the morphological families that we have tons of compound words in English shouldn't be a secret to kids. And you know, compounding doesn't work like another um, uh, morphological family like facilitate. I mean, if you do words like, um, you know, fire house isn't a house on fire. And for those of us who are native English speakers or who came to English fairly early in our lives, we often don't realize how idiosyncratic a lot of the meanings of, of compound words are. You know, a greenhouse isn't green necessarily. I once had a greenhouse that was green, but they aren't always green. Okay, but a dog house is usually where a dog lives, although we also use it metaphorically. Okay, what are the, ah, here is this wonderful slide that I had promised you that I had um, thought I hadn't included. So it turns out that in my analysis of those 10,000 texts, what I established is that there are particular groups of synonyms that really matter in narrative text. And these are actually groups of synonyms that have to do with story structure. You know, when we communicate something, so if a character is planning rather than scheming, the author is telling you something. Okay, so I went, I took these clusters of words and found the most basic word that kids are likely to know. And then I developed these networks around the words. Okay, and I showed you some of them earlier. There are instructional lessons of these called super synonym sets for students. And there are also forms that kids can fill in. Please don't expect that, you know, a third grader would be doing all of this at one time. This is to do over a period of time. But what we're wanting to show kids is that, you know, the word go is at the center of action and action is really important in stories. And there are a whole bunch of words that relate to that. So it's not just teaching these boutique words, you know, like lethargic or even dazzling in the Wizard of Oz. It's about teaching kids about these networks of ideas. And of course, the best way to go about that is in also extended writing. Okay, um, now in terms of thematic networks, I told you that we have these 16 topic sets at Text Project and what I really like about them, and these come from the 2,500 words, what I really like about them is we've given you 
some semantic maps to work with. Okay, so all the words around money in the 2,500 words are organized around these three big ideas. And then we take each of those ideas, so this is one of those topics, okay, and there are words that describe, and what we've done is we've provided illustrations and notice that we're also showing um, syllabication. I'm not saying kids are being asked to um, put words into syllables, but I'm saying showing them, you know, in terms of phonology, how, how that's read is really critical. One of the things Linnea Airy has actually shown is that being able to, to read a word aloud, and I'm not suggesting that everything is being read aloud, but when you're learning some of these words, when you can pronounce it, that can really help you in your um, fluency with that word, it, with its meaning. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm learning my native language, which is German. That's one of the projects I've taken on during this, um, this sheltering in place period. And um, I really notice that when I hear the word, I often relate it to, I, I know that I've heard it before when I was a child or as a, as a young adult hearing my parents speak. Um, and, and that can really help in the learning. And I'm saying a lot of these words kids will know. Remember, it's very hard, if not impossible, to decode a word if you don't know what it is, right? How do you know that you got it right? So this um, function here is really important. And what I wanna keep emphasizing here today is that we want kids to have records of what they've learned. Um, and here's some examples, clustering books together and then some records of, of what I've learned. And you know, if we can do these records digitally so that kids, as they read more on a topic, um, as they maybe watch a video on a topic, they can keep adding to these records. I think the records can be um, graphic, they can be, you know, you know, pictures, they can be in a lot of different forms, but it's important that um, kids have some record of what they've learned. So what did we talk about today? Started out by saying, we read to learn, whether it's a narrative or an informational text. Texts are where human beings have always stored what they know. Words are central to that knowledge because that's how we label ideas. And there are two aspects to our vocabulary. One is that we have this really small group that accounts for the majority of the words in text, but they're not just a list of Dolch words. They represent major bodies of knowledge and they give a lot of insight into how words work. So we can use those words to help us understand and expect that they're gonna be compounded words, that they're gonna be derived words, and also that there are multiple meanings of words. Next, I talked about rare words. And I said, kids have to know this. And it's not that I'm not good at reading, but there are always gonna be some rare words. That's a good writer is gonna give you some new information, give you some new things to think about, give you some new comparisons in, an, in a narrative text. Um, and what I really notice in, in learning to read in German, um, the presence of these rare words when I just pick up um, a children's book to read versus, for example, when I do an intentional program like Rosetta Stone, where the words keep being repeated. We have to keep thinking that when there are rare words that are new to your vocabulary, that there actually needs to be some repetition of them. And finally, I gave you three actions for the kids who depend on schools to become highly literate. I said, Freddie, you've been accidentally muted.
There you go. Okay. So somebody muted me. I don't know if I said something that was really offensive. I hope not. Okay. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. We've been I, enjoying I'm it. I'm kidding. Thank you, Freddie. I don't know how long I've been muted. I was enjoying myself and I was sharing what I knew with myself, but I said there are three big actions. One is that we focus on knowledge, that we stop worrying about covering every single reading strategy that a reading researcher ever invented. Not that some of them can't be important, but what I'm saying is about what you're learning right now and knowing that those texts are such an incredible source of knowledge. Next, I talked about a category of text I call intentional text. And I showed you some text to text project. I talked about quick reads a little bit. And I also showed you the words opening reading doors product. That's a digital one. And I said, that can be good for kids who've been having some issues attending. And finally, I said, let's uncover some of these ideas for kids. Let's let them know about words that are particularly prolific in terms of their networks, the ideas that occur a lot. And I showed you both um, some synonym clusters and also some um, word pictures for informational sets of text. Now, here's text project. The classroom materials that I described are right here. Um, we've got about every single thing that I've written and some of the things I've forgotten that I wrote over here in the library. There's a, uh, there are lots of books that have gone out of print that are here. Um, and this presentation will be in the about area. Um, so I invite you remember everything at the site. This is, um, if you see my name on a product, even before this um, um, school closures, uh, the money that come from royalties for products with my name on them go to text project. And we're gonna have a special fund uh, for anything that happens with Word. So um, this is just, it's a family foundation my husband and I have, and it's something we're, we're offering to the kids of this planet. Uh, and finally, I invite you, uh, I'm gonna give away three free copies, and I tend to give away more than that. And then I also have some other books. So if you send your small change, remember I need a snail mail to actually send you. I'll get rid of them when I have that, um, when I've sent you. Um, but if you can send your small changes um, to smallchanges at textproject.org. And finally, I wanna say thank you for what you've been doing and who you've been during an incredibly hard time in our history. So um, Dustin, I'm ready for questions. Oh, I have a few for you here, Freddie. <clears throat> it's Mike. Oh, it's Mike, okay. Um, one of the questions was, what is the recommended amount of time per day on this program? Or how many minutes a day do students need to use Word? It's about 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, for some kids, I, I really don't want to uh, go on the record for pupils to start thinking that Freddie's saying that, you know, kids need to be on um, digital devices forever. But for some kids, this is just going to be really, really critical. And for some kids, you might actually want to do it a little bit longer. But the, um, the pr uh, project has been set up for 15 to 20 minutes a day. Okay. Um, another question. Can you clarify word families as opposed to word themes? Are they related the same or totally unrelated? I don't know what the question relates to word themes. There are topic themes. Um, and for example, there's a topic theme related to to money, could that be called a word theme? Um, I mean, what, even within um, a thematic network, there are word families, right? So a word family is, it's a morphological structure. So think about, for example, the word um, commercial, commerce, 
that's part of a word family. You could say that commerce and money are part of a theme. Okay, I don't know that I'd call it a word theme, but you could, I guess. But yeah, commercial, commerce, word family. So it's a morphological structure. Another one is, how does the, the unique vocabulary of narrative text differ from that of informational texts? In a story, let me, I hope I'm not making anybody sick by going back through this. I know I should be able to just So in a story, and this is why as you get to harder or more complex narrative, a writer uses a palette of synonyms to describe something that's really critical. So certain writers will have a tendency to use particular kinds of categories. So one writer, um, um, Sharon um, Crouch um, writes about a little girl who doesn't have access to spoken language. And there's just an enormous amount of, um, of words related to sounds in that book, okay? In another book, there'll be a lot of words related to movement. Most books have something related to movement, right? Because there's something happening in the stories. But what I'm saying is that a narrative writer doesn't keep using the word glittering over and over and over again, like they did in the Dick and Jane books. You know, they would help, help, help. A narrative writer, that's not high quality literature. So a narrative writer uses, you know, this palette. You can kind of think of it like, you know, colors. And I showed you the palette is really heavy on words related to communication. I guess I could actually do this and then find my slide here. This is a really important distinction because a lot of our vocabulary we've taught with narrative. And what we haven't really helped kids with to the degree we need to, as I showed you at the beginning, um, you know, those words having to do with in, in me and Uncle Romy. And, and what I'm recommending in a story like that is that's an example of a book that has an enormous number of compound words having to do with art, which is kind of appropriate, right? Because it's about a collage artist. So, so a, a, a really high quality writer isn't going to say happy a hundred times. But in an informational text, you are going to have um, repetition. So if it's a book about uh, investments, you're going to see a word like account or investment over and over again, or economy. Okay, so, and, and the words in the, in the informational text are, are belonging to a network of shared ideas. So these words aren't synonyms. These words build on each other. So as you know more about um, absorbing or combining, you're learning more about dissolving. Or when you're learning about uh, abrasive, you're learning more, you're expanding your idea of property. Abrasive isn't a synonym for, um, for property. Okay, so it's a, it's a really different stance. And there's a higher, much higher likelihood that the writer is going to, you know, a mathematician isn't, running to a thesaurus to look for a word for equation, a synonym for equation. Okay, these words are going to be connected to each other in meaning um, in a different kind of way than the words are connected in meaning um, in, in narrative text. I hope, Mike, that that explains it a little bit more. Yeah, that was great, Freddie. Uh, uh, before I ask you this next question, I just want to say that uh, hats off to you and your husband for being so generous and charitable with what you're doing with your foundation. And um, we all appreciate it. Love you. Thank you. 
Well, Mike, it turns out that I'm a child of, um, you know, my, my parents were immigrants, refugees to North America and public education has been very, very good to me. Very good. It's funny you say that. My grandparents came from Austria-Hungary and uh, had the same kind of uh, touch of a background, but we really appreciate what you're doing to your foundation. We love you. There is a question here and it says, um, how is it what you describe different from the traditional approaches the vocabulary, such as the tier approach or the six to eight words a week from a story approach? Well, I, um, sadly, I, I was so concerned knowing that these folks are sitting for such long periods of time in front of a computer. I didn't want to bore anyone. So I haven't shared the slide that illustrates what I would do with the words in me and Uncle Romy. But what I would do is take an idea, okay, such as um, places that, that um, James, the boy in the story, visits in the book, or things that his uncle makes in his workshop. Okay, which is a concept having to do with words related to art. That's really different. Do you see that when you list these words like this, conceptually, there's nothing that connects them in terms of the big theme of the story. This is a story about a boy coming of age. This is also the story of what an artist does and how he spends his time and what he creates. That doesn't pop from this. So in the networks of words that we're developing, it's all about teaching students. Most basically, it's about what the meaning of the story is and how the words fit into it. Um, I can go into my, <laughs> my files here and find a good slide. Um, I'll also post one. I'll post one on Twitter to illustrate, but what I'm interested in is taking the idea from the story and ensuring that we've got lots of connections around that idea. Do you want me to find a slide, Mike? Uh, actually, you know, if you could send us a slide, we'll include it in a, in a send out handout next week. And okay. that would yeah. be great. I'm just saying, I, I have some slides that illustrate conceptually what you would do with this text. So instead of learning this little group of kind of, I mean, I look at them and go, is the word yanked such a critical word in your vocabulary or smeared? And does it require a really conceptual leap to learn that word? And I, I don't think it does. A lot of these are known words or can be known very easily if connected to another word. So if it's really important to understand what this artist is doing with smearing and mixing and so on, then I wanna have a set of words around that. So in what we typically do in a generative approach, which is what I'm describing, we want kids to be able to generate the meanings of words, is rather than teaching these kind of random, unassociated words, we're teaching networks of ideas related to the meaning of the story. And that also extend across text and teach you something about how English works. Because English, you know, the words aren't just random words. You know, they're connected in different kinds of meanings. They're connected by morphology. Would you say wow. the word program would be a good way for students to build their reading fluency, oral reading fluency, along with their sight vocabulary? So I just, yes, the answer is yes, they are gonna become much more fluent because they're attending to the words that, that extend across text. See, there's, there's research that shows when you have a lot of rare words that you don't know and have to figure out, you're not very fluent as a reader. So if you have opportunities to get really good, 
you know, have more experience with, um, as I was showing, you know, a text like the one about compound words, um, you know, that's going to help your fluency. So yeah, this, this is something we use in fluency practice. As I said, in fluency, I always use informational text because it makes sense to keep like the word baseball or basketball or so on, you keep repeating them. Okay. And Typically, these are really short texts, but a word like cannonball is repeated here a couple times. I don't think spaghetti is. Ballerina is, but ballot isn't. But we try, and, and in word, those words are repeated. So um, I, I want to also point out that we are wanting kids to recognize these words automatically, but we're also using them in word to teach the network of words around, you know, so you're not just learning those 2,500 key words. You're actually learning about 12,000 words because each of the morphological families has about five words in them. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I do want to get it across that you're, you're um, expanding your vocabulary incredibly. You're adding to your rare vocabulary too, but it's really about getting good at this core vocabulary and the concepts underneath it. So what I was saying is they represent big ideas, they represent how morphology works in English, and they represent understanding that some words have different meanings. And I have another question. Can you clarify the 4% versus 6% of rare words and the comparison chart presented with knowledge clustered text versus guided reading type of programs. I'm looking for that. So in this text, what I'm saying is that there are more unique words in, when you don't have text clustered by knowledge. So that means that the rare words are unlikely to be repeated. If you have 4% versus 6%, this means for every 100 words, there are six words that kids likely haven't encountered before. In the knowledge base, it's four, and there's a higher level of repetition because there are fewer words. And more, and there's also more opportunity to experience the word families. So it's not just experiencing help, but it's also experiencing helpful and helpless and so on. Here's another great question. Are there super cinnamon synonym sets for students? I must be getting hungry, I'm thinking of cinnamon. <laughs> um, are the super synonym sets for students something that can be purchased? They're, they're available for free. Everything at Text Project is free. So those were, um, you know, there, I think we've got 32, however many lessons there are here. So that would be 20. And then there's another product at Text Project called um, um, everyday words. So there are also everyday words. Um, so that has, I think, about 35 lessons. So all of those lessons in the forms, so these forms, like this one, are, are for um, free download. So this can be downloaded for free, just like the books that I showed you are free, just like these pictures are free. So we've got about 600 pictures at Text Project that you can download by topic. Is that computing, Mike? I mean, this, these pictures, so there's 16 topics, each with about 20 to 30 pictures, and it's, it's free. You can download it. Do you have a, um, your website handy that you could put up? Yep. Because the moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is Text Project is free to you. So please go out there and download all the work that Freddie has put together for you uh, because I think the key word here is free. Well, it's not just free, it's also evidence-based. 
which I think is really critical, right? So yeah. these are just things that I thought, I mean, everything that I've made here and presented, I did as a prototype hoping publishers, other researchers would model. So there are, you know, about 400 texts that are downloadable that fit what we call this text model. That is the 2,500 words account for the majority of the words in text. And then the words that are rare have at least a modicum of repetition. So what I'm saying is all of this comes from evidence based on, on this idea of an economical vocabulary program. Let's not just teach random words. Let's teach them in relation to how they work in the language and what they mean in, in, in you know, networks of text. So yeah, all of this is, um, Pat Cunningham, by the way, did just a fabulous job of writing um, um, a tutor manual uh, for, for tutors and for parents um, that I think is just excellent around the beginning reads. And then, you know, in the literacy topics here, I've clustered everything we have, like we have probably what, about 60, 70 um, videos on our YouTube site. So I've clustered things around that. And I also have a little magazine called Text Matters, where I take something like the notion of text complexity or what I've been talking about today with vocabulary. I left y'all um, as part of the handout, a, a paper that actually we paid to have it so that you don't have to go to a library to get a copy. Uh, so it's open access um, and you can share it with anybody you want. An article in, in the most recent reading teacher on, on this approach to vocabulary. So it's moving beyond the six to eight words, the tiers. It's saying, let's teach kids the underlying ideas of words. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of resources here. Thank you, Freddie. We really appreciate having you as part of our uh, conference and symposium. Um, it's been a long time coming, but I gratefully, gratefully thank you for your work and um, the website and actually coming on and sharing this really great knowledge. Thank you so much. Well, Mike, for your vision in doing this, I think is just, we really applaud you. And uh, I could go back to that slide with the clapping, you know, um, <laughs> but we really appreciate it. Um, well, and I appreciate this opportunity to share with folks. Um, I really do. Thank you very, very much. It's a team effort, Freddie. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.